Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, as you know, uh, intelligent process automation is a strategic topic today for CXOs, but uh, more particularly for CIOs too. And uh, with modern automation, governance and platform are key. Um, Bonitsoft is an active uh, vendor of this market, and therefore we want to bring you uh, the best uh, experts and, uh, and give you information around automation and automation projects. So today we've asked uh, Neil Ward Dutton, uh, one of the best specialists of uh, automation, uh, to present IDC's view on uh, the new business automation uh, toolkit. So uh, Neil and myself uh, will be available uh, at the end. So feel free to ask questions during um, uh, using the question panel during the presentation, and I will ask Neil the questions uh, at the end of this presentation. Uh, everything will be recorded, and you will have access to the slides afterwards. So thank you very much for attending, and Neil, you're on. Perfect. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you for inviting me to do this today, and uh, welcome everyone. It's uh, great to see you. I'm glad you could take the time. And um, yeah, I want to take the time to talk about um, business automation, um, how the landscape is changing and how it's really time for organizations of all kinds, uh, big and small, old and new, to actually take a bit of a fresh look at uh, how automation technology can add value and the different pieces that are available, uh, the toolkit, if you like, because there's been a lot of change. It's a very dynamic market. And um, it's really, really important that you and uh, organizations generally make sure that you're really uh, up to speed with what's going on and can make uh, the most effective decisions about what technologies to choose and how to use them. So let's get started. I'm gonna start by um, talking about um, digital transformation. You might think I'm starting a bit high level, um, but it's really important that we get everything in context because this is really the one major driver behind everything we see in the automation space right now. Now, there's lots of different ways of looking at digital transformation, but one thing that's always interesting to do is to share uh, how we at IDC expect the digital economy to play an increasingly large role. Um, and what you can see here is that we're expecting that over the next four years or so, there really is going to continue to be a really significant shift in how digital products and services and experiences are going to drive the real world economy. And you can see here we're expecting that over half of that economy in Europe is going to be driven by digital products and services. It's a huge, huge shift. And we see this playing out in uh, conversations with CXOs. And indeed, when we ask C-level executives, they consistently tell us that now is the time they're under pressure to actually deliver real results. So importantly, though, this is not just about having some kind of innovation lab. Yes, it's important to have some kind of innovation capability. And maybe for you, in your organization, the right way to do that is to have an innovation lab, but that is not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, as, and I'll, I'll explain a bit more about why that's so important and how that plays into the automation landscape. But as you can see here, that we, we're finding that a large percentage of European CEOs, so that's not CIOs, not CTOs, not CDOs, digital officers, CEOs, tell us they're under real pressure to deliver real results. So that's not just about innovation labs, this is about scaling, uh, scaling efforts and getting real business returns from investment. And it's when you really start to explore what that actually means that you realize why having an up-to-date view on automation is so important. So before I move to one level deeper though, it would be really crazy for me to talk about this and to not talk about our current situation, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we, we, we can't ignore that, it's huge. But actually, you know what, we see this actually as a, an acceleration uh, factor for digital transformation. We really do see that many, many organizations around Europe, and also more broadly, they're seeing that 
um, the unpredictability this is creating in their operating models. Fundamentally, not being able to be sure about who can work, where they will be able to work, when they'll be able to work, or how they'll be able to work. When you bring all that extra uncertainty in to an environment where you also have this situation about demand, you know, how can you deliver products and services in the right way in, in today's environment? When you add up all this uncertainty, you realize that actually just relying on the old physical models of doing business, which rely on you being in a certain place at a certain time with certain kinds of tools to deliver the right result for your customer, we, we can't do that anymore. So we're seeing that many organizations are really looking to accelerate, accelerate more aspects of their digital transformation. And that comes through increased intelligence. So, for example, trying to figure out how can we use digital tools to become more accurate in our supply chain predictions, more agile in our supply chain. How can we reduce some of those air gaps that exist in business processes through better automation? And how can we get closer to our customers? We find that organizations actually are accelerating all these initiatives as a response to the COVID-19 situation. So yes, we see digital transformation having a big impact and actually we see the current COVID-19 situation actually accelerating many organizations' responses. So let's go one level down and think a bit more about what that means for the way that we actually organize the way that work gets done and how we make things happen in our companies. The important thing to realize here is that when organizations like yours um, put digital initiatives in place and they start to really mature those initiatives, they're actually starting to create two different ways of working. On the right hand side, the orange uh, pillar, if you like, on this chart is the digital world. And on the left side, the blue piece, that's the kind of, uh, you might call it the kind of old fashioned uh, business world, the old, the old fashioned way of doing things. And fundamentally, they are, they are completely different ways of looking at how business needs to work and how things get done. In the old world, um, you know, and any organization that's been around for more than a few years has much of their business running in this way. It's fundamentally a kind of a push way of thinking about how your business needs to work. You start with thinking about what you're good at, what, what products sell well, you know, how you can leverage your skills um, to create new products, uh, you know, where are your existing relationships, your expertise areas, and then you figure out how can we take that to market? How can we figure out how to sell more of that? How do we reach new customers? We're starting from the inside, uh, from, from what we know has worked in the past, and then we think about how to push materials and products and services through a supply chain towards our customer. And these kinds of models, these kinds of ways of working, they typically have always historically revolved around forecasting, long-term forecasting, lots of long-term planning, linear flows of product and material, um, this product first mindset. But a digital mindset is, is like completely flipped on its head. There, fundamentally, the, the philosophy is about, let's start with a customer segment. Let's start with thinking about a problem that a group of customers has. And now how can we contribute to solving that problem? And that's not then necessarily about the product that you've always been able to build. Uh, and deliver. It's about how can we solve new problems for customers and how do how can we contribute, but also how can our ecosystem contribute? How can a group of our companies and, and our partners work together to solve problems? And that's a very much a, it's a customer first way of thinking. It's an outside in way of thinking. So rather than starting about uh, thinking about what we're good at, start by thinking about what the customer needs and work backwards. So it's completely the other way around. And rather than building everything off long-term planning and forecasting, much more in this digital world is based on listening to the market, listening to signals from the market, understanding what emerging patterns of demand there are and figuring out how to respond to them. So again, completely the other way around. And this is kind of interesting as an intellectual exercise, right? But where it becomes really important is that any organization, and maybe this is your organization, any organization that is now seriously on the road to digital transformation 
has now a lot of time and money and effort invested in this orange pillar. And you've still got a lot of time and money and effort invested in the blue pillar. These two things coexist, they exist together, but they're very different. How do you bridge them? How do you actually make these things work together? Because unless you can make them work together, you're going to get in trouble. So how do you actually make the leap and bridge that gap between the old world and the new world before it's too late, before your competition takes over, before the market changes, before uncertainty makes your business really, really challenging? You have to find a way to bridge the gap. And there are two ways that organizations try to do this. Some organizations look at all their legacy systems and organizational pieces and processes and think, can we re-platform them? Can we move those to a digital way of working? Re-engineer the systems, create new processes, create new organizational uh, teams to work in a new way. And yes, you can do that, but it's risky and it takes time. And that's not just about shifting to the cloud. That's about ad adopting new culture, new ways of working. Um, much more agile, collaborative ways of working. The other side of it is to start from the digital perspective and think, well, how can we wrap? How can we kind of work backwards towards our core systems, our core processes and our core organizational uh, teams and bring them with us? How can we kind of wrap around what they do and make them more fit for purpose for the digital world? And the truth is most organizations need to do a bit of both but you need something that fits in the middle and that's really the strategic value of today's automation technologies is bridging that gap bridging the old world and the new world the slow uh, the stuff that's been engineered to be really efficient and predictable with the fast and the agile and the stuff that should be more able to react in an unpredictable world it's about building that bridge that's what automation is all about all right so what we find is as organizations start to realize that they need to link these things together and then move forward, it starts to bring a realization that there needs to be more of a, a, a deliberate platform approach. So I don't have time to take you through this in detail, but just to, to talk about it quickly, what we commonly see organizations do as they progress with their digital transformation is they start with what we call islands of innovation. And that's the kind of thing I was just talking about. Your innovation labs, your kind of, uh, your, your garage type mentality, where you have a, a separate group of people, maybe in a separate place, doing their own cool stuff, right? Maybe um, doing some cool mobile stuff or IoT or blockchain or AI or something like that. But they're not really connected to the rest of the organization they're not really connected to the rest of the systems they're just doing their own thing and you know what when you're driving driving new innovations and you want to explore a new space that's actually not a bad thing to do you don't necessarily want to be held back by your all your old systems your old ways of working you just want to try out new things and that's cool but when you find something that needs to scale when it works and you want to make it really successful and deliver real results you have to figure out how to connect it to everything else and that's where we start to see the second phase is connected islands where organizations start to try and figure out how to make point to point connections between these islands of innovation and then the the core of what they do already but still that's quite fragile it's inefficient it doesn't really solve any of your deep seated problems it just creates these kind of tactical connections so then you start finding organizations having a more strategic view of these two pillars side by side. And that's what I just showed you, where you've got your digital world and your kind of, not legacy quite, but your kind of existing world. Those two different operating models. But over time, you have to start trying to integrate. And it's really important that you start to think more deliberately about a platform approach. Because the problem you can run into if you don't think strategically is that by trying to connect your islands of innovation, you end up just creating islands of automation. You end up with lots of little uh, integration and automation initiatives that aren't really connected up. They can't learn from each other and you can't really scale your outcomes. It's only by actually having more of a, a strategic platform approach that you can start to create um, a common understanding 
of what works in connecting your old to your new, your fast and your slow, uh, understanding of what, what you can't do, understanding about the optimum ways to use the technology, different ways of leveraging patterns for certain use cases. All of this kind of stuff only really comes once you start to really think more deeply about a platform approach. So how can you leverage a whole variety of different automation tools and techniques and do that in a strategic way that really understands use cases, patterns and best practices? That's what we're talking about. So what I'd love to understand, and I'm, Carol, I'm hoping you can help me out here, is we've got a little yeah. poll prepared and I would love to understand where you think your organization is at in that journey. Are you just creating these islands of innovation? Are you starting to connect together? Are you actually starting to run a digital kind of pillar alongside your core processes? Are you actually starting to really integrate these things at a more strategic level? So we'll we'll let people vote. So you have just to click and then uh, it should be there. Uh, sometimes some people have issues with sorry if you if you don't manage to to vote. I'll just leave that a couple of seconds more and then uh, we can get the results. Okay, so let's close this now. So Neil, you you see the results, I think, on your on your um, tab. So we have fifty percent of our audience that is in the step one, um, and then twenty twenty seven percent in step two, um, and and after that it's twenty percent in step four. So here you go. <laughs> I'm just trying to find uh, uh, the right way to maybe share the uh, uh, are the poll results coming out through the. Uh, yes, they the are. Visuals? They are visible now. You, okay. you can see them. Yeah. Okay. I I can't actually see them, but as long as everyone else can see them, that's fine. Yeah. So. Okay. Very cool. So um, uh, it sounds like quite a few people still at the beginning of their journey, but then uh, also a fair number. As you said, about twenty percent who are more up towards that level yes. of. Uh, needing to, to really seriously start to integrate the old and the new. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Thanks, Carol. All right. So let's let's keep moving forward. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, now, let's get into the tech side of this, right? Let's talk about the tools in the toolkit. Um, the, the first thing I want to do is to is to explain how really we've we've come a long way in a quite a short space of time. Um, in the last sort of five years, we've seen a huge shift in what's possible with integration and automation. Um, you go go back um, 10 years, certainly, and um, we had a situation where if you wanted to run a big integration or automation project in your company, you, lead, you needed a lot of money, you needed a lot of time, you needed a lot of resources. And so what you found was that because of the tools and the technologies available, um, you had to really only use those for the biggest hairiest problems um, so you found that you know the the typical places where those things would be um, where those things would get be employed would be in big banks in big telecoms companies sometimes in big insurers and um, they would really only use those to focus on the really really uh, high volume really critical kind of core business processes but actually as i'm sure all of you know if you need to get all this right you can't just focus on those problems you you need to focus on a whole variety of different problems and opportunities and what we're finding is that with the shift to um to as a service the shift to open source the shift to more consumable tools and the rise of low code we're really seeing a new way of being able to engage with integration and automation and that, that actually creates huge new opportunities for organizations. And this is where RPA comes in. Um, everybody wants to talk about RPA, right? Um, it's uh, I'm showing this is a bit of a joke. I mean, this is a really important uh, market category, a really important area of tooling that solves real problems for organizations. The reason I've shown a unicorn is because there's been a, so much venture capital money going into some of these companies recently, we have a number of these unicorns that are valued at over a billion dollars. Um, 
so RPA is everywhere, right? It's it's quite sexy, um, but it's also quite hyped, and it's not always clear and easy to see what you can really do with RPA and where you need more. And the truth is that if you're really considering automation strategically, you can't just focus on RPA. Yes, it can help you in some key areas, but it can't solve all your problems. And I want to take a moment to just dig into that in a bit more detail. So like I said, RPA is one element of what we would consider as being a modern business automation toolkit that you can use to drive a, a true automation strategy that's going to enable you to kind of really go on that digital transformation journey. Now, there's a lot of text on this slide. I'm not going to read it all out. The main point I want to bring out is, that, is the stuff on the right. So RPA is fundamentally, at its core, the value is about freeing up the value the functionality, the data that's locked away in many legacy systems. Yes, of course, we can all use those legacy systems, but they don't really lend themselves to being integrated with. And so you typically, the integration is essentially me or you. It's a, it's a human that has to kind of do swivel chair integration, lots of rekeying, lots of data entry, lots of manual reading out of, uh, of data from a screen and then typing into another system. RPA, is all about automating the tasks and the procedural elements that are involved in mostly in legacy system usage, data entry, uh, reporting, those kinds of activities. So when you have elements of processes, tasks, procedures, um, which revolve around getting putting data into a legacy system or getting it out, that's where RPA's real sweet spot is. And yes, you can use it for more different kinds of activity around that, but unless the use case you're looking at is kind of centered on that, that uh, need to kind of integrate to get it data into and out of legacy systems, then you've got a question about whether RPA is actually the right place to start. All right. So what we commonly find with organizations when they deploy RPA, and many organizations are deploying it, and they're starting to deploy it at scale, we find a number of challenges. And the three we, we most commonly find are around change management. So, um, you know, RPA is built around essentially uh, what, what are commonly called bots, but essentially uh, scripts um, under the covers, you know, scripts that will uh, look at I say look the the the, the script will uh, will interrogate fundamentally a screen in some way through this variety of techniques that they can use interrogate a screen to to identify data fields uh, and then to read values out of those fields or to put data in um, that's fundamentally how they work um, so these uh, these scripts can automate the keyboard the mouse and also to locate certain parts of the screen to read or write data and uh, essentially they're, so they're kind of spoofing a human uh, and a, a human's interactions with the with a UI a legacy UI but one of the big challenges that organizations have particularly as they start to scale and they start to deliver value over time is that those legacy systems change um, and not always in obvious ways so what you can find is if you build your system into brittle away um, fundamentally, the automation can become out of sync with the back-end legacy system. And uh, then you find that if organizations don't get their heads around that, that drift, if you like, automation drift, they can really come unstuck. You can end up with a lot of exceptions and a lot of quality problems. So that managing that change management process, is it can be super, super complicated. And this is a really important issue to to think through because often RPA is sold uh, to business people and part of the promise is that you can use RPA as a team of business people without IT involvement and the, the challenge is of course is as you start to scale and as you start to deliver value over time you do need to engage with IT because if nothing else it's typically IT that manages those back-end legacy systems so you need a common way of communicating around change of back-end systems and change in automations, change in requirements. You need common ways of talking about security. So how are your bots going to um, 
handle login credentials for systems? How are those credentials going to be secured um, and, and, and you know access to those? How is that going to be controlled? So there's all kinds of important issues around liaison, around coordination between IT and business. And this is another really important area that, that organizations need to think seriously about. And lastly, uh, how do you create a, a kind of factory that enables you to scale over time? So yeah, you can get some value in one project with RPA. We are employing a handful of bots to, to, to help you with, let's say, handling uh, processing of invoices. But where you start to get real value is if you can go beyond invoices to also purchase orders and maybe then aspects of customer service, like ad address changes in your call center or um, handling aspects of complaints or customer correspondence or HR, like, um, you know, um, issues around uh, your annual appraisal or maybe it's around screening new candidates it's when you start to think about multiple use cases multiple projects that the value really starts to scale but there it becomes crucial that you have a way of building a kind of factory so that you can you can actually deliver best practice and you can do that at scale so i want to talk about the process piece and how um, how the process piece can really help you deliver value and deliver value more at, at greater scale and over a greater period of time. And the way I'm going to start by doing that is by explaining how process and the flow of work kind of has to underpin everything. Now, uh, there's a build here, and I'm starting by talking about how organizations typically start their digital transformation efforts. Typically, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with this. Typically, organizations start their digital transformation journey focused on how can they deliver products and services and experiences to customers in a better way? How can they deliver consistent experiences across multiple channels, across multiple different venues? Um, how can they integrate services and products so that things seem seamless and the interactions kind of don't have any bad handoffs where you talk to one person and they can't help you and then you talk to somebody else and they have to start again explaining your problem right from the beginning or if you want to start an interaction on your mobile device and then you need to go to the web or a call center having that all integrated so that there's no break in the experience yeah so that's how organizations typically start and that's actually a great place to start but it can never be everything because actually what sits behind all of that is a whole load of other stuff right so when you look at any organization that's got a significant heritage they've spent 10 15 years not trying to integrate everything for customers but actually going in the opposite direction actually um, distributing their operation all the internal stuff that supports the customer all of the hidden pieces, they tend to get spread out. So the creation of shared services centers, offshoring, outsourcing, the increased use of partner networks, supplier networks, all this creates more distribution, more moving parts in your operation. And how, then the question is, well, when you're trying to bridge the gap between the old and the new, between your core operations and all of the new cool digital stuff you're trying to do, well, if one needs to be all integrated and one is all spread out, how do you do that? And the answer is, it's really fundamentally all about flow and it's all about process. Because when you think about how that customer journey, you want to be seamless, how that customer journey is supported, well, you know what? The, the data and the transactions and the insights and the responses that support that customer journey, they're flowing backwards and forwards through your organization right so to, to really produce that seamless experience you have to be able to take that customer's data and drive transactions through this kind of digital thread that's woven through your existing operations and that some of that's operations is that operations that you control centrally but some of it might be a shared services center maybe run by somebody else or it's offshored or it's outsourced or it's done through partners you have to have this digital thread that enables people and systems and data and insight to flow seamlessly. And unless you have that view, which is fundamentally a process view, unless you have that lined up, then 
you're going to really struggle when it comes to delivering that value at scale that CEOs are under pressure to deliver. To give you an example, let's say your digital teams create great new mobile app, you know, really, really cool new mobile app for your, for your customers. But let's say that when people kind of sign up through your mobile app, that the customer onboarding experience is still really slow because it relies on legacy systems. So your, you know, your new customer who has maybe seen an ad somewhere for your new mobile app, they want to sign up to your service, they put their details in, they get the app, but the features aren't fully enabled for like two days because it there needs to be some some checks in the background that still rely on legacy processes and systems. Well, I would argue maybe it's this is worse than not having created the mobile app in the first place. Or let's say maybe you give people a great mobile app and a great website, but your bills that you're sending the customer are, are, are they're inaccurate or maybe they've got three products and you're sending them three different bills with three different look and feels and the customer can't really make sense of them all the you know the right customer journey the great customer experience you're really striving for it's not just about the mobile app or the website or or whatever it's about all of the stuff that sits behind that it's about all of the operations and it's about the right processes and it's also around the right moments of truth and decision points that live within those processes. If your people can't make the right decisions at the right time with the right information and, and drive automations, yes. If they can't do that in the right context and they can't, if they can't do that at scale time and time again, then all of your front end digital efforts will be wasted. So you really have to line everything up and it's the process view that ties all this together. And as I said, it's not just about automation, it's also about people. Um, you know, we get fixated on um, automation uh, and we get fixated on automation as kind of like an all or nothing binary proposition that either you kind of don't automate or you automate everything. And the truth is that actually in the real world, when you look at the whole spectrum of use cases that are at play, it can't be just one extreme or the other. There's actually a whole variety of different ways you can make your business more successful and more effective in support of the customer in these moments of truth. Sometimes the way you most uh, effectively drive new value is not by automating. It's just by providing human workers, experts in their field. It's about providing them the better information in a better format so they can consume that information quicker and they can help the customer faster. Sometimes, yes, it is about straight through automated work. Other times, it's actually somewhere in the middle. It's about leveraging AI, leveraging machine learning, advanced analytics to give workers the right kind of insight, predictions, personalization, um, recommendations, so that, for example, in a call center environment, you can uh, have a prediction that this person calling in is uh, likely to be wanting to, to uh, churn, likely to want to, to move to a competitor because your system knows that in the past they've had some bad interactions with you. Maybe um, based on that customer segment, you can make a recommendation um, with another customer for a particular kind of upgrade or a particular kind of cross-sell or a new way to solve a problem because you know what's happened already, you know what segment this customer's in. So it's not all about automating or not. Automation and, and better use of automation technology can play at multiple levels to bring information and insight, prediction and recommendation to people. But it can only do that if you have the context around it. And again, this is where flow and process come into the picture because it's like the container for all of that insight delivery to the right person at the right time. So let's zoom out and look at what this toolkit actually looks like. Um, the, the sexy stuff, if you like, is what we've talked about already. We talked about RPA. We've talked a little bit about AI, um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. That's the sexy stuff, if you like, that, that, that is new, and it's typically being pitched to, to business leaders, to business teams. But we can't ignore the stuff that's been around for longer, workflow, process automation platforms, 
and also application integration and API technologies. Actually, those things are super, super important. We can't ignore them because it's only when you look at all these together, you really get the ability to drive the, the broadest range of use cases and to drive the broadest range of responses so that you really apply the right technology in the right way to the right use case. So, second poll for you, which of these elements are you using in your organization's automation strategy today? Are you using RPA? Are you using AI? Workflow? Integration platforms and API management? Which of these pieces are you using? Let us know with a poll. So the poll is on and you can you can vote. I will leave people for a couple of seconds. Interesting. Okay, so I'll I'll close. Um, okay, and share the results. So, um, Neil, do you see them, or do you want me to read them to you? I'm afraid, Carol, I don't see that. I don't see the results, but hopefully okay, everybody so else can we, see. Okay, so we we have we have about um, seventy percent. I mean, people are using multiple, of course. So we have 70% using workflow and API management. So the what you said, the historical um, mm -hmm. elements. And then we have 30% with RPA and 22% with artificial intelligence and 38% with automation orchestration, so the core. So maybe you'll give a bit more elements about this, this core element. Very cool. Fantastic. Thanks very much, everyone. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, we'll talk a bit more about all these these bits. In in fact, in the next slide. So um, the next slide is going to take a, a couple of minutes to get through, but uh, I, ho I really hope it'll be useful because it's one thing to show a kind of like a a cartoon almost of the major elements that are in play, but actually it becomes much more interesting if you're able to show how they really fit together and that's what I'm going to try and do in the next slide. So let's move forward. So um, let's let's look here at, at, at an, anatomy, uh, an anatomy of work automation. Let's look at where all the pieces fit together and um, <clears throat> of course somebody once said that uh, all models are useless, but some some models are worthwhile, right? So every kind of model that you try and put together is going to be a bit wrong in some ways, and there's lots of different ways of looking at this. So hopefully, though, this is this is useful. Um, I'll start by explaining what you can see on the screen here. So what I'm really trying to do here is look conceptually at the different kinds of things that organisations try and uh, try and work on, try and improve when they're automating, um, the different ways they can focus. So we've got two main kind of pieces here. Um, the main uh, box on the left, the, the main pillar, is about the kind of your, your business in operation. So it's the things that happen day to day to, to, to drive work forward. Okay, so let's start at the top. You have requests coming in, that could be from customers, but equally they could be from other parts of your business. So let's say, for example, this work is all to do with um, HR. Uh, well, these requests are going to be from employees, from managers about, you know, uh, new hires, or um, you know, can can we get some new headcount? Um, you know, can we update this person's profile? What do we do about this disciplinary issue? These kinds of things, requests coming in from customers if you like that may be internal or external then we have context so when you have uh, work coming in a request um, typically you you kind of have an idea of what work needs to be done to fulfill that request but it's not just about knowing the process to follow you also need context you need to know okay well who is this person that's being asked about uh, let's find that person's information let's say again it's in HR um, and maybe it's about recruiting some new headcount well 
all right, well, so what's the area of the business where we need the headcount? What's the, what's the right profile for the people we want to hire? Um, what agreements do we have with agencies who can help us? Uh, and, and have they been any good at helping us before? What kind of contracts do we have with these agencies? Because we need this headcount really quickly. Who can turn this around quickest? That's the context for the work. It's not just about structured data from relational databases. It's also about often things like contracts or, or requests, emails, um, other kinds of historical uh, trails of, of, of information. That's the context you need to do the work. Now, when it comes to actually doing the work, of course, there's almost always a process. There's multiple things that need to be done, and often they need to be done by different people at different times, and you need to coordinate that work. And in that work, you've got a number of tasks, and you've got a number of decisions that need to be made. And then at the bottom, particularly in today's environment, almost everything we do um, requires some kind of software system that needs to have a record updated or you need to pull data out of it. So we've got our existing resources, our applications and databases and spreadsheets and so on. So that's the kind of anatomy of the work as it is in operation, flowing from requests at the top through to people actually doing the work with the context they need through to the resources that they need to update or, or get information from underneath. And the right hand side, we've got um, another part, which is more about it's not really the work itself, but it's then leveraging insights about the work to improve the work. All right, so it's monitoring improvement analytics. So if we can use digital tools to automate aspects of the work, then we can also get data about how that work is flowing, how those tasks are executing, how the decisions are being made. And we can understand how long they take, who's doing them, what kinds of results are we getting for different customer segments so maybe we're really effective at doing work for customer segment a but with customer segment b it always takes much longer why is that well you know if we're collecting all this data from our digital work our automation platform then we can start to understand more about what's really going on and where can we improve and that's what this piece on the right is all about the monitoring analytics and improvement so now I've explained what that anatomy looks like. Let's now kind of superimpose these different elements of our toolkit onto this, this schematic and see where they fit. First off, RPA. Well, actually, the core of RPA just sits down there at the bottom. It's fundamentally about um, simple tasks, not all tasks, but it's about simple tasks that are mainly about interacting with legacy systems. So it's those, those routine administrative tasks where we're getting data out of legacy systems, putting data in. Often, of course, it's not just one legacy system. It could be many. You know, I've seen situations where it's five, ten systems that need to be worked with to, to actually carry out a fairly simple task. And that's where RPA really sits. And that's what it's great at. Now, workflow. Uh, or more broadly around workflow core digital process uh, <clears throat> excuse me digital process automation tools are really about creating the the frame within which a lot of the work happens and that's not necessarily about automating the individual tasks or automating the individual decisions it's actually primarily about automating the way that work flows between tasks and decisions the way that work is coordinated Yes, in many cases, some of those tasks can be automated and the decisions can also be automated either through scripts or through things like business rules engines, decision management tools, but they don't have to be. The core of the proposition of, of, of workflow is actually, it's just really about automating the way that work moves. It's not necessarily about the individual tasks, although it can be. Now, Application integration and API management technologies are fundamentally, um, I mean, this is a, a simplification, but fundamentally, um, a, uh, they sit alongside, conceptually, RPA. Again, it's about improving our ability to get data in and out of systems and to facilitate automated movement of data between apps. So we can sync up records across different applications. We can coordinate transactions 
across different applications and make sure they're all updated with consistent information and we can wrap things like tra transaction handling around those so again that sits at the bottom that's fundamentally about coordinating and automating data flow between existing systems and then AI AI is actually slightly more complicated this is probably a whole other presentation in itself is about thinking about the different ways that AI adds value to this picture um, and there's there's multiple and I've shown just the four main ones here so on the left um, the, where, where I've got the AI box around context that's an area we commonly see uh, being employed particularly in in uh, relation and at the same time as RPA but it doesn't need to be that's primarily because actually the RPA vendors are pushing it the hardest and this is what many vendors or many people would call intelligent document processing um, it's fundamentally about using AI to look at incoming documents when you get a request uh, looking at um, contracts looking at um, requests for, for work, looking at invoices, looking at purchase orders, whatever the document, the business documents are that are flowing in with a request, looking at context and using AI to make sense of that. So fundamentally extracting the structured data out of unstructured data. So let's say you have an invoice that's a PDF. Well, let's use AI to quickly read that and get the key data items from that invoice out. Maybe we don't even know if it's an invoice. We can use AI to figure out if it is an invoice. Maybe it's an email, but it's an e email from uh, from a language that uh, our, most of our operations people don't speak. Maybe it's uh, in um, I don't know. Um, maybe it's in uh, uh, you know Israeli or something like that. So how do you make sure that you can translate? Uh, again, those kinds of things are where we can use AI. But that's just one area, that intelligent document processing that's really about helping us with our context. We also see that AI, of course, through chatbots and conversational interfaces up at the top here, can be used to drive automation in the request piece. So um, rather than relying on voice or phone uh, or chat, actually have chatbots handle simple requests and provide simple responses or to gather a lot of the information before passing it on to a set of humans who can work on a problem. We can also see, of course, AI, particularly machine learning around structured data, being used to drive predictions and recommendations into the flow of work. So this is where you find something called, um, that some people call next best action, using um, machine learning based on historical data to say, given the context we have and the particular details of this situation, I think the next thing you need to do is X or why and this is really really powerful uh, and we see more and more organizations looking at this kind of next best action technology and lastly we can use AI on the right hand side in the improvement of work we can use machine learning to look at the historical patterns of work patterns of performance and to predict what kinds of things need to be done to make sure we can hit our service levels are there some kinds of escalations maybe we need to make to make sure that our work gets completed on time? We can use AI technologies and techniques to drive smarter ways of improving our work. So AI kind of plays across the piece here. The point I want to make here about AI is that when you bring workflow and process perspective into this, you really kind of expand out your the ways in which AI can really add value. If you're just focusing on RPA, then you probably mostly end up using AI for doing the intelligent document processing because that's typically a lot of what happens upstream of, of RPA style of work. You have a request to change an address, comes in by a letter that's faxed to you or something like that. You use AI to read the fax, to get the data, and then to put that data into some legacy systems to update the address. But when you start to bring the workflow and the process context in, you start to open up lots more opportunities for using AI. All right, I need to move forward because we're running short of time. So quickly, I want to talk about how this new world of automation really opens up a new way of delivering value. As I said earlier, go back five, 10 years, and automation was really about those biggest, hairiest problems. You could really only apply it to really big, complex problems. But now, when you consider 
what we call at IDC, we call third platform digital technologies. So the use of cloud as a service models, um, mobile technologies, those kinds of things, um, modern um, architecture, modern platforms. You create a new way of delivering automation that really enables you to break through all of those op old operating model uh, assumptions around who had to be at a certain place at a certain time using certain systems to get the work done. You start to create complete independence from location, from time, from role, all of those things. It creates a lot more resilience in your operating model. Then you add on the use of advanced analytics, ML and AI, in all of those scenarios I just explained. You start to be able to bring new ways of people being able to work together, to leverage insights from each other, leverage insights from history, to automate aspects of customer interaction. And then you bring in the value of low code, which enables you to bring many more different people into the automation conversation to get work done in a more agile way, a more collaborative way. It means you don't always have to rely on what may be a very, very overstretched IT department. Yes, of course, tech people still need to be involved. We need to find ways to bring them into the, the conversation, but we shouldn't rely on them for everything. And low code tooling is a great way to bring um, broader groups of people together to collaborate on solutions. And when you think about all these three things stacked up on top of each other, you really start to see that a modern business automation approach isn't just about efficiency and productivity in your business. It's actually about improving your business resilience. If you use modern automation tools to build modern business capabilities, you just create a more resilient operating environment for your business. And that's super important right now. And I just want to show briefly a chart from a recent survey. We're, we're currently running a whole stream of surveys around Europe to figure out what's happening with the COVID-19 situation. And what we're seeing consistently is organizations telling us they expect that demand for task and process automation technology is going to increase because of COVID-19. So this is just really giving you some data to back up what I've already said. We really do see organizations accelerating and seeing the value of this technology. I want to leave you with a brief point about scaling success. Um, I talked a bit earlier about um, creating these kind of factories that help us scale. And it's really super important. If you're really serious about employing automation strategically, you can't just leave it up to technology alone. You need to be able to scale your practice, not just scale the tech, scale the practice. And that is likely to come through a center of excellence or a COE. I'm not going to give you a detailed uh, breakdown of all the things that you need to think about when you're building a COE. Um, that would take a whole presentation in itself. But what I do want to call out is that you do need one. If you want to go beyond one, two, three projects, you need one. You need a way to scale your practice. The other thing I want to call out is that your COE, the way that works for you, is probably not the same thing as somebody else's. And the reason is that your COE has to work in the context of your culture. In your culture, do, um, but does budgeting and finance tend to all sit in one place? Does all the tech budget live with one team? Or actually, is that tech budget spread around between different groups? Do you tend to have a very uh, controlled way around how um, platforms are managed? Or indeed, is there more freedom? Those kinds of uh, cultural choices that organizations make need to be reflected in the COE. You have to reflect those existing realities in the way your COE works. So don't be, uh, don't go down the road of thinking you have to build a COE according to a particular template. Build it in a way that is sensitive to your organization's culture. But here's a set of things that you probably will want to think about in some form in your COE. All right, just as we come up to the end of our time, I want to leave you with a couple of key messages. First, stay in control. You need to think about automation strategically. You need to start to try and build a platform that you can use across lots of use cases. But don't be led by vendors here. Make sure that you stay in control of your destiny. You have a clear vision of where you're going and that you have a clear way of understanding uh, how to measure the value of different kinds of use cases. And don't be seduced into going after 
dozens of new use cases until you feel you understand how to get value. Second, remember that although we're talking about technology here, this is about change. It's about changing the way people work and about how they deliver value in their lives. So embrace that, work with people at the start of your projects, all the way through your projects and also at the end. Find people who will be your champions and will explain the value of this to everybody else. Thirdly, back to the COE, scale your practice. If you see more than three, four, five opportunities to use this tech, you need to think now about how you're going to build and really um, give the right fuel to a center of excellence. And fourth, RPA is really, really important. It has a lot of value to add in some situations, but as we've said, it can't do everything. Think about the whole toolkit and how all these pieces add value to each other. And uh, with that, I want to turn it over and see if we've got time for a few questions. Yeah, we we will have we will have to answer very quickly. So I'll I'll go ahead. First question was um, you spoke about automation and augmentation. How do you see the place of humans in this spectrum? Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, I'll try and answer it quickly. It's probably a really long answer actually, but. You know, like I said, there's a there's really a spectrum, all the way through from automation at like the top end, through to actually just using integration and automation technology to to pull data together better for people. And then we've got a whole range of things in the middle of that spectrum, right? So um, providing more like directed insight, personalizing things for for your workers or for your customers, providing recommendations and predictions. This is like the spectrum. And for all of those different ways of delivering value, that's about humans in the center. There's really probably only about, I would say, 20% of use cases, maybe even less, where you're seriously able to consider full automation. It's probably less. Um, but you know, in the vast majority of use cases, humans are going to be in the loop. They are going to be driving the ultimate outcome. And so this is one of the reasons why that toolkit is so important is because you need a blend of approaches to deliver the right value in the right use case. And they bring the ultimate intelligence because they yeah. are the one. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. I have a question on some keyword that we hear sometimes. Uh, anything about digital twin organization? Yeah, so um, that's a term that some people use um, fundamentally to represent a kind of um, a model of how business is operating. So um, you've got digital twins of products, right? Um, in manufacturing, a digital twin of your organization is more of a like a, um, a performance model view of your business. So this is really about, it's fundamentally about that kind of right-hand side of the anatomy picture. Um, but if you imagine uh, a, a set of dashboards and, and that you can really drill into to explore, how are all your processes running? How is your work performing? Where is it working? Where is it not working? Where are the opportunities for improvement? What happens if I make a change? That's really what the, the digital twin of the organization is all about. And this kind of technology we're talking about is a fantastic way to start building that digital twin. Yeah. Uh, and maybe, yeah, the last question is, that's something we often hear from, from our customers and prospects is when you look at the automation toolkit, there are all these technology and they ask, where should I start? basically. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> so uh, because uh, the, the easy answer is it depends, but okay, what does it depend on? Um, I would argue that it, it has to come right from your business priorities. So um, let's say um, you, uh, let's say you have a priority to um, improve the way you onboard customers. Well, it's it's kind of fundamentally it's about um, it's a kind of like theory of constraints. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You know, when you look at a, a, a process view like we've been looking at, that kind of end-to-end -end view of how you improve part of your business. Ultimately, there's probably not just one problem. There's probably three or four problems. You could call them constraints in the system. What are the things that are holding you back from really improving, from really creating that major breakthrough? Uh, in, uh, performance improvement. There's probably three or four things. 
but what's the root problem? Where is the, what's the, the thing that you need to untie first before you can start to, to solve the larger problem? You, you can explore um, the different constraints on your system and see what is the, what's the main thing that's holding you back from this improvement. Often actually it really is, um, it's, it's using RPA, but um, because so often what we find in today's environment is that organizations focus a lot on the digital piece, the front end customer facing piece, and then they start to have problems as they work backwards into the core. It's like stepping backwards step by step into the core of the organization and saying, how do we line everything up to deliver the great customer experience? And you hit a roadblock because you have some legacy systems, legacy processes that slow everything down. The work is maybe there's lots of rework, quality issues, and sometimes making the first step to untying that knot is about some simple task automation, but it's very rarely the last step. It might be the first thing you start with, but you very quickly need to go beyond and build that bigger picture. Well, that's a good conclusion, I think, Neil, and I thank everybody for your participation. As I said, we will share the recording and the slides, and if you have Further question, of course, we can we can receive them and Neil will be happy to answer. Absolutely, so yes. Have a great uh, day, evening, wherever you are. And um, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.